All right. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so um, thank you all so much for being here. It's a great turnout. Um, I'm Susan Faludi with Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies. Um, and I, I want to, oh, uh, also I've been asked, in case you didn't notice, there are books for sale um, right outside afterward. Um, <laughs> yes, and we have a signer, uh, more than a signer. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, I want to thank especially the Society of Bowdoin Women, whose Edith Lansing Sills Fund for Exceptional Women uh, made this evening possible. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, and we indeed have an exceptional woman. Uh, it's a total pleasure to introduce one of the most clear-headed thinkers of the women's movement and one of the most fun. Uh, they say feminists are humorless. <laughs> but if you've read Katha Pollitt, you know just how hilarious a feminist can be. They say feminists are knee-jerk but Katha always writes with originality and subtlety. They say feminists are lockstep, but Katha is never afraid to question her sister travelers, uh, especially when she finds their arguments less than persuasive. As I was reminded when I picked up The Nation magazine one week and read a column of hers that started there's definitely something in what Susan Faludi says, <laughs> but <laughs> thankfully, Katha took me to task in her usual good-spirited and witty fashion. Um, when Katha Pollitt started writing for The Nation in 1995, she was the first female columnist in that progressive magazine. Uh, since then, she's won the National Magazine Award for Best Columns, um, and then again for S Best Essays and Criticism. She's also written many essays in The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Atlantic, uh, et cetera, that are thought-provoking, timely, and timeless. Um, we've had a lot of discussion this past year about sexual assault on campus. And in that light, it's really worth rereading Katha's rousing piece in The New Yorker back in 1993 called Not Just Bad Sex. Uh, it's a takedown of the effort to minimize the magnitude of rape on campus, and it's as relevant as ever. Katha Pollitt also writes exquisite poetry. Her poems have been published in The New Yorker and other magazines and anthologized. Her collection, Antarctic Traveler, won the National Book Critics Circle Award for Poetry. And, oh yeah, uh, one of her New Yorker essays, Learning to Drive, has been just made into a major motion picture starring Patricia Clarkson and Ben Kingsley. Uh, Katha wields many literary and polemical powers, but among her greatest are these an ability to cut through a completely stalemated and hashed and re rehashed subject and get us to see it in a wholly new and fresh light. And an ability to stay rational while being mad as hell. Maybe nowhere are these gifts more on display than in her current book, Pro, Reclaiming Abortion Rights. And what could be more timely, as we're reminded this week, as anti-abortion congressmen threatened to shut down the US government to punish Planned Parenthood. Too many pro-choice people, Katha wrote in a recent New York Times op-ed, have been way too quiet, shamed into silence by stigma. Thank God one woman is refusing to be quiet. We are so lucky to have her here. I give you Katha Pollitt.
thank you so much for that great introduction, Susan. You said all the things I was going to say, so we can all just go have a glass of wine now. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Society of Bowdoin Women, for bringing me here. I'm really grateful for, the, for you and the long tradition of support for women that you represent. Um, I want to just, uh, one note is that uh, Uma Blanchard and Rachel Barron are starting a chapter of NARAL here at the campus, and you can join up uh, in the back of the back uh, after my talk. Um, so um, there was something else. Oh, I know what it was. You know, when I give a talk, everybody is totally pro-choice in the audience. So if there's, and, and that gets a little boring, I have to tell you, I, I just feel where is the love from the anti-abortion people? <laughs> they should care. So um, if anyone is here who doesn't agree with anything I say, I would really, it would really be very interesting to hear. Um, and I hope you will, you'll ask a question um, and uh, we can, uh, it'll broaden the discussion and, and make it a little more um, interesting. Um, so anyway, my talk is called What? It's the 21st century and we're still fighting for reproductive rights. Um, alas, it is so true. Um, and this is why I wrote this book. People ask me, well, Katha, why did you write this book? Um, I wrote this book because even abortion is one of these topics that everybody thinks there's nothing more to say about. In fact, I've, I've read that in um, debate, uh, you know, campus debating societies will not allow abortion to be the topic because it's called a dead topic. Nothing more to say. Um, but I think that it's precisely with these dead topics that there's often a lot to say. And the reason there isn't, seems to be not a lot to say is that people aren't um, going beyond the platitudes. Um, so I wrote this book because I thought there was a lot to say. Um, and the book is structured as less a debate between pro-choice and anti-choice and more a discussion of what do people think who are in what I call the muddled middle. Now that doesn't sound very nice to call people the muddled middle. Um, and I took that. Um, that euphonious name, phrase, from a writer named Roger Rosenblatt. Um, and uh, if he had returned my phone calls, I would have given him credit. But he never did, so I said, OK, I'm, I'm taking it. It's mine now. Uh, uh, but these people are also sometimes called the mushy middle, which is, I think, even less nice. Um, and what they are, they're people who, which is most people, most people in America who are not uh, aligned firmly with one, one ideological position. Um, they are people who believe, well, OK, we can't make abortion illegal completely because then women will have illegal procedures and there will be injuries and deaths and all like that, um, as there were before Roe v. Wade. That was one of the reasons Roe v. Wade was passed. Um, but you know, abortion, I just don't like it. There's too much of it. And, sluts and, um, you know, just people not being responsible. Um, and so these people, which is, again, most people, um, have a view that they don't quite recognize. Uh, they think they're very principled, but actually, if you look at polls, what you see is, um, there is a principle there, but it's maybe not the one they think. So there's uh, Gallup did this sort of compilation of polls where they asked uh, people, um, when do you think it's OK for a woman to have an abortion? And what they found was uh, very little support for the idea that it should be always criminalized the way it is in uh, El Salvador and Chile, uh, although Chile is changing. But you know, completely illegal even to save the life of the woman. Um, that has maybe somewhere between 8% and 17% support. 17% seems like a lot of people who would say, yes, yeah, she should die. But anyway, eight is a little better. Because I think in America, you can find eight people who believe anything. 
<laughs> there's just any position, there's 8% 8, 8 that believe it. Um, and so, okay, then what if, you know, to preserve her health, okay, her physical health, her mental health, okay, okay. Then rape, oh yeah, she gets to have an abortion then. Incest, yeah, oh yeah, we can't have that. Um, what about, you know, severe fetal damage? Um, and that also gets above 50%. But after that, it plunges. So what you have is if you had voluntary sex, you have to have the baby. If you're not going to die or be, you know, if you can get through pregnancy and childbirth okay, you have to have the baby. So this includes, I'm too young, have the baby. Um, I don't want to be a single mother, have the baby. I'm too poor, I can't support a child. Mm, you've got to have that baby. Um, I, I don't want to drop out of school. Oh, sorry, have the baby. All, and the thing that's so fascinating is, if you add up all those reasons people approve of abortion for, it's maybe 8% of the actual abortions that women have. Um, I mean, those reasons which are very serious and, and very um, important to talk about, although I'll have more to say about that in a minute. Uh, and there's no question that the uh, anti-choice activists would like to criminalize abortion in those very severe, terrible cases. It's still more than 90% of abortions are for the reasons people say, no, 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 you can't do it. Because women have abortions for social, economic, and personal reasons. Um, and this is the thing that we have to talk about that people don't like to talk about. Um, and you know who doesn't like to talk about it is not just people who are in the muddled middle. It's people who are pro-choice. It's our pro-choice movement. And that's another reason why I wrote this book. I thought, you know, we've got to get off the dime where, we, where every time Congress proposes some awful new law, the pro-choice movement gets up and says, but what about rape and incest? What about, you know, the life of the mother? These things are very important, but over time, what they do is that they add to the stigma of women who are having abortions for that much more common, regular, ordinary reasons. Um, and what that does is it doesn't, it disempowers those women from speaking up. Um, so I want to throw out some numbers here. Um, I am very far from being a statistician. There are many graphs that I don't know how to read, like the scatter plot one. I just learned I'm, there are a lot of people who don't understand how to read those, uh, and I am one of those people. Um, but I do have some statistics in the book, and, and I want to just go through a few of them because it, it relates very much to all of this, and I think it clarifies a lot of things. Okay, nearly one in three women will have at least one abortion in her life. 60% of women who have abortions are mothers. Almost 90% of abortions take place in the first 12 weeks of pregnancy. Only 1.5% of abortions take place after the 20th week of pregnancy. 95% of women who choose abortions do not regret their decision either immediately after or three years later. Now, why are these important statistics? These are important because they cut through the stigma and the picture, the stereotype that so many people have of women who have abortions. Who do they think have abortions? Well, sluts, of course. Um, so you have your teenage slut. Ah, oh, she's really terrible. Then you have your 20-something slut who wants to live in an apartment in New York and have fun and, you know, go drinking and ha have her little career. Um, <laughs> then, and then you have the biggest slut of all, and the biggest slut is, um, the cold-hearted career woman who hates children. Um, these are the women who have abortions. And this is why you have your stereotype that, oh, the woman has an abortion, the girl, the teenage girl has an abortion to fit into her prom dress. This was an actual ad in the LA Times, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, put out by the, the archdiocese. Um, claiming that this had actually happened, you know, girl has abortion to fit into her prom dress. Um, and um, 
uh, which turned out to be an apocryphal story, and they had to kind of take that back. Um, and then you have the woman, that same girl maybe, but later in life when she's a cold-hearted career woman, um, she's having an abortion so she can go on her European vacation. And I always think this is so fascinating because this shows you the class, the class dimension of this, that okay, it's always a European vacation, it's never, and she had an abortion so she could go fishing in the Ozarks with her husband, you know, <laughs> or she, so she could go spend time with her mother in, you know, Southern California. Um, it's always something upscale. Both these things actually are kind of upscale. So um, uh, once you say one in three women will have at least one abortion in her life, and some will have more than one, you're really saying this is kind of a normal thing. This is a normal part of American life. We don't talk about it as, as if that were true. We talk about it as this, this is this extreme and terrible situation that a very few bad women are involved in. Um, but we don't talk about it as a widespread thing involving all different kinds of women at different phases of their life. 60% um, of women who have abortions are mothers is, is, I think, a profound statistic. Because right there, that shows you it is not about hating children. It's about wanting to do right by your children. It's about acknowledging what it takes to be a mother in, in, in any society, but maybe even a little more in this one than in some others that have much more support for mothers and families and children. Um, in this society, you have that baby, you're kind of on your own. Um, you know, we don't have uh, paid, paid maternity leave, let alone paid parental leave. We don't have child, um, child care. Um, child care is, is like college. Um, I remember when, when my daughter got out of preschool and she got into you know, regular public school, it was like this huge savings. It's like, oh, free money, this is great. Um, um, and it, what it shows you is how carefully women are considering this, that they know what it's like to be, to be a mother. They know what it's like to be pregnant and give birth. Um, and this sh also shows you, this statistic shows you how, uh, misguided, maybe insincerely so, if that makes any sense, it is that we have all these restrictions now that, well, you have to have a waiting period so you can think it over. You have to look at a sonogram. You have to hear a fetal heartbeat. You have to have a doctor who's going to tell you um, that, you know, everything about the stages of fetal development. And also tell you, you know there's a lot of help out there for you, which is not true. Um, so this is said, to, oh, also it'll cause breast cancer and things like that. But this is being said to women who have already given birth. They know that they are not growing a cantaloupe inside. They, do, they have already seen a sonogram because everybody sees sonograms now when you have a baby um, I mean, in the course of pregnancy. So there is nothing surprising about this. Um, and yet our legislatures act as if, oh, if women only knew, if women only knew that, they were, that, there's, a, you know, that there's a baby developing inside, they wouldn't have an abortion. That's, that's really not true. Women, even, you know, women who believe it's a baby um, would call it the baby. They still have abortions because that is how important it is to have a life that gives them a shot at um, staying, you know, above, keeping their heads above water. Um, I, one statistic that should also be in here is that around 60% of women who have abortions are 200% of the poverty level or below. So they're either poor or they're near poor. Um, and, you know, here again, we just don't do anything for these women except um, demonize them um, and um, make life much more difficult for them. Um, I sometimes think, you know, okay, well, in this society and maybe in many others, we pay for the things that we think are important. So what if someone with a lot of money, like the Catholic Church, said, well, if you have a baby, we'll give you $50,000. That would probably cut down the abortion rate. <laughs> you know, it probably would, or $100,000 would cut it down even more. Um, but we don't do anything like that. 
Um, we do not offer women who, there are, I'm sure there are women who are ambivalent about their abortions, who would like to have the baby, sort of, maybe, kind of, but they can't. They can't make it work for them. And those women, I think, would benefit a lot from, I mean, you know, those, there might be some women who would be persuaded to have the baby if life weren't so tough for them. But do we, make, do we think, oh, let's get those people on board with having that baby? No, we don't. Um, so uh, we need to think about that again. Um, then, okay, now let's look at almost 90% of abortions take place in the first 12 weeks of pregnancy. Why is that important? It's important because it shows you a lot of things. One is, it shows you that women really want to take care of this situation as quickly as they can. Um, in fact, I think it's like 60% take place in the first eight weeks of pregnancy. And when you consider it takes a while sometimes to real, even realize that you're pregnant, um, I think what you see is women going to considerable lengths to, uh, to have their abortions before uh, it reaches um, the second trimester. Um, and so if this is all the more remarkable given that it's getting harder and harder to find that, that abortion um, in many parts of the country. So you see, women are really, women are really uh, not the stereotype of, oh, she, why did she wait so long? She was too busy having sex, that's what it was. She was having sex and she just couldn't be bothered to take care of it. Um, so then you have only 1.5% of abortions take place after the 20th week of pregnancy. Now, why is this important? This is important because that's where the discussion is now. Now there is the pain-capable Unborn Child Protection Act in Congress, which would outlaw abortions after 20 weeks um, on the theory that at that stage, that precise stage of development, um, the fetus can feel pain. Um, and if you ask, just to be sort of horrid, if you ask, well, okay, well, if the problem is that it feels pain, can't we just give it, you know, an anesthetic first and then kill it? Um, if, if you were to ask that, then you are cutting through the, to the real reason why they want to pass this law, which is to make abortions harder to get. This is part of, this is, all, next it's gonna be, oh, and at the 18th week, here's something that happens that we, you know, that was really horrible, and then they're 15th, and you know, they're getting very good at whittling away at Roe, at, which protects, this is completely contrary to Roe, Ro, which says, you know, you can't restrict abortion in the first two trimesters, or viability, depending on how they figure that. Um, and this is well below that. Um, so already the Supreme Court, if it follows its own precedent, is going to have to say, I'm sorry, this 20th, this 20th week stuff is completely unconstitutional, but will it? This is unclear. We have four anti-choice justices, four pro-choice justices, and we have Anthony Kennedy, and I'll get to him in a minute. Uh, <laughs> So he's like the most powerful man in America. It's kind of amazing. Uh, I mean, for a democratic country, we give a lot of power to uh, individual people um, who maybe weren't intended to. Maybe, I don't know if the founding fathers wanted to set it up like that. Um, then my last statistic is also really uh, important. 95% of women who choose abortion do not regret their decision either immediately or three years later. Now, why is this important? This is important because the way the um, abortion opponents in their new, kinder, gentler mode, where we want to ban abortion because abortion hurts women. Abortion hurts women, that's what it's all about now. Um, they want to make a case that having an abortion is uh, something that causes women lasting and terrible psychological pain. Abortion regret. Now, the science around abortion regret has been deconstructed and dismantled and demolished many, many times. Um, it's all nonsense. But uh, it is deployed very skillfully, politically. Um, there are women who, um, 
and I've been to the March for Life um, on the anniversary of Roe down in Washington, and there are these women who, and I feel very sorry for them because I think some women do regret their abortions as we all make mistakes and regret things, um, which is not a reason to make them illegal, but in the pro-life pro arguments it is. Um, so there are these women and they, they testify to this, their sorrow and grief at having had an abortion from these laminated cards with their life story. And the life story is always the same. It's always, I didn't really want to do it. I was pushed into it. Um, they told me it was just a clump of cells. My boyfriend said he would leave me. Um, I was, and then I had a terrible life for a long time, like two, 20 years, taking drugs and having more abortions. And, um, and then, and then I found, then I found Jesus, and now I know, and now, and now I know I'm forgiven. So, you know, these, you know, you laugh, but these women go to state, they go to state legislatures, they give these, these speeches, it's very effective. It is very effective. Either it gives, it persuades people, or it gives them a rationale to do what they would do anyway. And one person it persuaded was Anthony Kennedy. Now, in, uh, Gonzalez v. Carhartt in 2003, which was the, a case involving the federal partial birth abortion ban, uh, with, which did not have a health exception. Um, it had a life exception, but it didn't have a health exception, and it was banning a particular method of having an abortion. So both these things were contrary to Roe completely. Um, but he said, and this was a five to four ruling, and he said, it seems unexceptionable to conclude some women come to regret their choice to abort the infant life they once created and sustained. So I, I, that word unexceptionable always gets me. You know, I've never heard that word in any other consequence, but I suppose it means you can't disagree with it. You can't make, it, you know, make an exception to it. Um, so, he, based on nothing, nothing scientific, just on, you know, being told, oh yeah, there are these women who regret, decides that because some women regret, all women should be prevented from making this choice. Now, I ask you, how often do we do this? Do you say some women, some, some people, some men and some women regret their divorces? Um, do we say, oh yeah, so everybody has to stay married. Uh, we, can't have, we can't have divorce anymore. Um, I, I kind of regret my college major, you know? <laughs> I majored in philosophy and because, I majored in philosophy because my freshman advisor said I should major in English because that was a good field for women. And I said, okay, forget it, I'm majoring in philosophy. <laughs> but actually I would have been much happier majoring in English. Um, and um, so, you know, we're, we're, our life is full of regret. Um, and that's just part of being human, and it, that's just the way it is. Um, and yet, in this instance, it became something that should be a general ban. Um, and uh, I can't tell you how surprised people are as they go around the country talking to learn just these few simple statistics, because this kind of fog takes place in people's minds when the subject is abortion, which people don't like to talk about. You're completely right to, you know, people who said, oh, why are you writing about this? Nobody wants to read about this. Um, I said, well, I just want to. I've got to write something. I'm writing about this. Um, but it's true. People don't, they don't like conflict. They don't like controversy. Uh, it's kind of yucky. It's women's bodies. It, it involves some blood. They don't like that. Um, and so in that fog of resistance to thinking about it, the reality escapes. And the reality is, look, face it, this is something that a lot of women do. It's part of American life. We could not have the life we have in America today if abortion was illegal, as it was when my mother had an illegal abortion. Um, widespread access to birth control and abortion as, an, as a backup when birth control fails um, is 
what underwrites the life we have now, where most people, most couples want two children. They don't want five children, they want two children. Um, we're very much against teenage pregnancy. You know, we're always going on about how terrible it is and it's a big scandal. We could say, hey, you want to have a baby when you're 17? Fine. But we don't. We say, that's a terrible, terrible mistake. Don't ever do that. Um, well, you know, teenagers, teenagers are teenagers. Um, and we make it very hard for them to get birth control and sex ed with all the abstinence-only sex ed that we're so keen on in many parts of this country. Um, so we make, uh, we have late marriage now. We have late people getting their careers on track before they have kids. Um, we have women who have kids that, and then they've reached the point where they can't support anymore and then they have abortions. I mean, some people have the abortion first and then the children, and I think poorer women have the children first and then they have abortions, which was the pattern in the 19th century, actually. Um, so anyway, we don't want to acknowledge that controlling your fertility is one of the most important things a woman has to do. Um, and it's something that is good that women do this. Um, and it's good for society. That, that's the sort of shocking you know, point of my book. Is it's good for society that abortion be legal because it lets women be educated, work, be mothers when they're in a good position to take care of those children well. And it's good for men. It's good for men because it isn't so great for men to feel so disconnected from children that they happen to father at a time in their life when they're not ready to be a father. Um, it's very good that people think about these things in a common, rational, planned way. I know that, that sounds so unromantic, but I really believe that. This is a very serious decision, having children. Um, and it's good for children to be born when their parents are able to um, give them the things that kids need in a modern society. We don't live on a farm where you start working when you're five. Um, you know, in the 19th century, you sent the kids into the factory when they were five. But in our society, you send them to school, and it's very expensive until they, you know, it's like, what, a quarter of a million dollars till a child is 18? Um, uh, so it's very important in a modern industrial society that values education and all like that, that children be born at a good point in their parents' lives. Um, so if you add up men, women, and children, that's society. That's all there is. So the ergo, I wrote, um, abortion is a good thing. But we never talk about it that way. We, ne we always talk about it as, oh my God, you know, abortion is really terrible um, and it has to be legal, yes, but um, you should feel really bad about it. And that's where the stigma comes in that is such an important part of this whole um, political cloud that swirls around abortion is that if, if you have an abortion, it's very hard for you to talk about it to other people. There's a great silence about it. And that means that the women who don't have an abortion because they, their much wanted and loved pregnancy has really gotten into terrible trouble. And you read those, those op-eds all the time, you know, where women, now that's coming out, because with the 20-week ban proposed, women are more and more saying, look, this is what happened to me in week 21. It was really, you know, the, the baby had no brain. What was I, what was I going to do? Um, but you don't hear so much from women who have abortions for the reason that the 92% have them. Um, you know, the, even to say, I didn't want to be a single mother. That's the truth. Um, you don't hear, and a lot of women feel that way. You don't hear that so much. Um, so there's a great silence on one side, and there's a great um, clamor on the other side. Because if you're sorry you had your abortion, you, you can talk about it all you want. Um, you can talk about the, 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 the personhood of the fetus till the cows come home. 
Um, and everybody, and you sound like a very sensitive person. I'm thinking of the, the least, what does the Pope say? The, the least among us, the most vulnerable. And then you sound like you're really a thoughtful, caring, kind person. Um, and, and you forget that that least among you is inside another least among you. The woman who's pregnant and doesn't want to be. Or, you know, like in Paraguay, you know, some 12 year old, who, some rape victim. Um, and uh, I think that that stigma is the big challenge for pro choicers now. Because what's happened is that we make our arguments on too much on the grounds of the other side. We are always, I don't want to go over, ooh, um, I'm going to stop in a minute. But um, we are too reactive, that we're always um, the, the, the Pro-life movement, I take my hat off to them because they're very skillful, they're very shrewdly political, um, and they um, have, they're a grassroots movement. They are. Um, I mean, grassroots, we think of grassroots, we think of the 60s and community organizing like President Obama and all like that, but they are the grassroots movement now. Uh, maybe Black Lives Matter will give them a run for their money. As, the big grassroots movement of our time, but right now it's them. Um, and they are enabled to do that because our side doesn't put forward a vision. Our side puts forward much more limited arguments intended to counter their arguments. Rape and always talking about rape and incest is one. Um, another is when we say safe, legal, and rare. Safe, legal, and rare drives me crazy because it puts the accent completely in the wrong place. It says, um, what's important is the number of abortions that there are, and you know there are too many. But it doesn't say, well, what does that mean? It's just, it doesn't necessarily mean, yeah, so let's just have a lot of birth control. <laughs> that would be good. Um, it means we have to get women not to have the abortions that they want. Um, it would be much better to say, safe, legal, and available, safe, legal, and accessible. But we've said safe, legal, and rare because to counter the idea that, oh, there's just all, it's all abortion all the time in the United States. No, no, it should be safe, legal, and rare. Um, so we're playing on their, their turf. Um, and um, uh, there's another thing we always say, but it's just gone out of my head, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but I think that uh, I just want to end on a note of hope, which is I do think um, that the pro-choice movement is, um, is accepting that they've been too reactive. And I think that uh, although young feminists come in for a tremendous amount of abuse, um, they are really doing a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful job of deconstructing stigma. And so you have things like, um, there's an organization called Sea Change, which gets women together, which is a young feminist organization that made a, an anthology of um, stories about reproductive life that's very um, intersectional, very multicultural, multi-ethnic, um, all different kinds of situations. And it gets women together like a book club to to talk about that and finds that once you get women talking about this, they start saying, well, you know, I had an abortion. And then another one says, well, I had two abortions. <laughs> um, and I think that's really important, really, really important. Um, there's also um, a lot of internet stuff. There's a group called One in Three where people post their abortion stories. There was a woman named Emily Letts who um, shocked the world by um, videoing her abortion and putting it up on YouTube. And although that does sound kind of gross, um, I thought it was really great because what you see is, look, the clinic is clean. Uh, look, um, I'm not in, in pain. Um, look, this is taking five minutes. It's just not what you think because along with uh, the many wrong ideas people have ab about abortions is the idea that it's always it's always dangerous, it's all, the clinic is dirty, they're just out to get your money, that's what this Planned Parenthood thing is all, about, all relies on, this pre-existing stereotype of what an abortion clinic is and does. So that it's very easy 
to segue into, oh yeah, they're selling fetal body parts to make you know, bundles of money, because that stereotype of the evil, money-grubbing, uh, abortion, cold-hearted, horrible abortionist is very deep in American culture from when it was illegal. Um, so anyway, I, I do feel that we're, we're you know, that, that, that pro is part, it's not all out there by itself. It's, it's part of the new way of trying to talk about abortion um, in a more, a less shamed, more open, more positive way. And I'll just leave you with one story, which is um, uh, my book um, had its uh, launch at the Minnesota Book Fair last year. And, um, and I gave my talk and all like that. And then afterwards, the woman who had invited me um, said, you know, and she was a middle-aged literary kind of woman. She said, you know, I had an abortion and I never told anyone, not even my best friend. And uh, I said, well, what do you think would happen if you told your best friend? And she said, she'd probably tell me she had had one too. <laughs> so anyway, thank you very much for being here. And um, I'd love to have your questions and there are people going who have microphones so you can just wave your hand and they'll come to you. Thank you. So the takeaway from here that usually happens after a la lecture is we can write letters to our congressmen, our state representatives, whomever. How do we take it to the next place. For instance, you're sitting in a bar in a hotel, you've gone to the book fair, and when you go to bars and hotels, people are always talking about sports. Mm. So do you turn to the person and say, well, what's your favorite method of birth control? <laughs> or, you know, do, are you pro-choice? Are you anti? Uh, I mean, what's a phrase that we can take? Because taking it to that social level where you're comfortable talking about it would be such a help? It's such a good question. You know, um, I was seated next to someone on the airplane who really wanted to have a conversation with me. And I didn't want to talk. I, I don't like to talk in airplanes. Um, but, you know, I said, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a writer. I'm going to Bowdoin to give a talk. And I just thought, oh, please don't ask me what it's about. I don't want to get into this with you. <laughs> you know? So, I mean, it's a big conversation to have. So maybe it isn't the first thing you, you bring out, you know, that you, you get someone to like you first. Uh, <laughs> I think that's always a good plan. Um, but, I, but, you know, your general question of what, how, I think, you know, talking to your friends, it doesn't have, you know, after I wrote that, uh, that New York Times op-ed where I said, you know, this is when we need help from the, all those women who've had abortions, that one in three, you know. Come on, um, you, privacy is privacy, but this is a very serious situation. You need, to, you need to get active here. And some people interpreted that as you have to come out publicly that you've had an abortion. And I got some pushback on that, but really I wasn't quite saying that. I mean, I, I got letters from people who said, you know, oh, Kathy, you're so right, I want to, but my mother-in-law is completely, anti you know, she's a fundamentalist Christian, and that would be the end of my life in the family. Um, I can't do that. Another person said, I'm not sure I could keep my job if I did that. Um, you know, there are people are embedded in social situations that uh, don't allow, we're all embedded in social situations that don't allow us to tell the full truth about ourselves. It's very, you know, the gay, when gays and lesbians did that, when they came out, they really changed society. But not every gay and lesbian person did that, and some people were out to some people and not to others. You know, they told their friends, they didn't tell their families, or the reverse. Um, so I think everybody needs to, you need to uh, keep yourself safe, I would say. But let's say, you know, you didn't, you never had an abortion, let's say you had one, you don't want to talk about it, fine. There's still tons of stuff you can do. Um, for example, you can join NARAL. You can, uh, you can become active in supporting a local clinic. 
um, either by clinic escorting or by raising money for them to help poor women fund their abortions. Um, there are abortion funds all over the country. There's probably one in Maine. And you can find them if you go to the National Network of Abortion Funds website, which is conveniently called fundabortionnow.org. Um, and you can, this is a hub of feminist activism. Um, and it's very intersectional. It's very, um, it's really a wonderful thing to do. You're helping, you're helping a real person. Um, it's not where you send your money to, you know, UNICEF and wonder how much of it actually reaches poor children. Um, uh, these are voluntary, mostly volunteer organizations, and you know, 95% of your dollar will go to help some actual poor women women get an abortion. So that's really important. And I think writing to your congressman, that's good. Um, calling up radio, you know, if you're listening to the radio and someone says something, you can, you know, a lot of these things you can call up, you can get into a conversation. Um, I think once you get into the framework that, okay, I'm really going to take a little, get a little energetic about this, you'll see that there's a lot you can do. Um, and, um, I think I should write a column, though, and give a big list of things. Because whenever this question is asked, I'm, I always feel like I'm forgetting things. I'm forgetting things. There has to be more than this. So um, voting. Voting is very important, um, especially for president in 1916, because, in 2016. <laughs> she will be in 1916 if, if uh, because, you know, the truth is, the truth is, and, and I know there are, there are many pro-choice Republicans, and. Um, I, I don't want to forget that because once I did and, and I got really chewed out by the pro-choice Republican who happened to be at this Planned Parenthood fundraiser that I was speaking at, I felt really terrible. Um, but the truth is, if the Republicans win the next election, it's game over. It is game over. They will nominate and confirm at least two, possibly more, Supreme Court justices. They will control three uh, you know, all three branches of government, um, and they will be able to just rewrite, they will, they will roll back, row back row, and they'll be, abortion will be probably always be legal in New York City, because um, that's Sodom and possibly Gomorrah, too. <laughs> Maybe Brooklyn is Gomorrah. Um, but, uh, but uh, you know, it's, it really will, it really can go backwards. And I think one thing that's prevented us from really getting as active as the other side is, is, is complacency because we actually, the law is on our side. Um, and most pro-choice people don't live in the places where the rollback of abortion rights has been the most severe. I mean, um, not many people live in the Dakotas. More people live in Staten Island. Um, Wyoming, it's t these places are tiny in terms of their population in terms of you know, geography, they're huge. But um, I think we've become complacent, and that's a real mistake. That's, that is really a real mistake. So, yeah. So um, I'm, I'm going to make a suggestion uh, to Lila's question, um, a former legislator. She's a former legislator. Um, I, and I'm going to disagree with you. Oh, I, good. I am uh -huh. pro-choice, but I'm going to disagree with you. I do not think the abortion debate is, like, finished. There's nothing to talk about anymore. Because the pro-life movement has become so infused with hatred. Uh, you, you know, hatred has become a very kind of accepted political fuse in this culture. And you do not have to listen to, uh, you don't have to go far at all to find, to recognize and experience at a gut level the hatred in the pro-life movement. Uh, our local community newspaper, the Falmouth Forecaster, there is a columnist to every column uh, whenever abortion, reproductive rights, uh, pro-choice comes up, there is a tenor of hostility and hatred. Uh, and we happen to live in a state where just this week uh, we have a governor who is manifesting yet another action of hatred. He has said if you are a childless home uh, and you have assets of over $5,000, 
which is nothing. Um, that means if you're a young single person who becomes pregnant, a mother, you cannot receive food stamps. Mm. Now, that is, you know, it, it is an act of hatred, denying that group, yeah. denying all of those people um, who will not get food stamps mm -hmm. who have assets of more than $5,000. You know, the larger message is, again and again and again, uh, that somehow conception and pregnancy are affiliated with hostility, animosity, and it is the exact opposite of the love that we would consider that would encourage young women to give birth to children. Uh, we, we hear it all the time from the pro-life movement, and nobody calls them out on it because hatred is often on either side of the aisle. It's not just mm. a right-wing issue. Uh, I think what we can do is start calling people, calling pro-life people out on their hatred. Jeering and insulting women going to Planned Parenthood uh, clinics, the one in Portland, Maine, for example, is not a gesture of love. It's not a statement that says, this is a culture that nurtures and welcomes childbirth. It is an act of hatred. It is a gesture of hatred. And I think we all, that's the responsibility that we have. The pro-life, the pro-choice movement, reproductive rights in my generation came forth to counteract a lot of the hatred that was manifest toward unwanted pregnancy. Uh, you folks, many of you do not remember uh, the you know, physical abuse, uh, the abandonment, uh, the you know, sequestering you know, during the duration of the pregnancy anonymously uh, while a woman gave birth. Joni Mitchell, for example, is somebody who was sequestered to give birth uh, to a child who was then yeah. adopted. Yeah. There's, you know, the reproductive rights were an effort to counteract right, the right. hatred of that. Yeah. So that's okay. something we can do. Okay, well, um, that's all really um, very well said. Um, I think there is a, a side of it that is that is full of hatred. I mean, I think when you you know you've got people, you know, uh, arson, murder, <laughs> um, uh, hatred. That is hatred. Um, and and some of the clinic protesters are really horrible. And you know, another thing that uh, I believe it was Anthony Kennedy also the kindly grandma. You know, trying to getting rid of the um, the protective space that. Um, the buffer zones, thank you for that word. Um, the getting rid of the buffer zones or making them smaller, and it was all about, oh, these kindly grandmas who just want to give you some, give you some counseling. Um, but a lot of them aren't so nice. Um, I do think, though, that uh, it's a good tactic sometimes to just give the people you disagree with to uh, a sense that you know, they're not totally evil. <laughs> Because not all of them are. I mean, there are anti-choice people who take uh, take um, pregnant women into their homes. Um, they're, they try. They try to help. But the thing is, uh, charity, the important thing is charity cannot solve the problem of poverty. Um, I have upcoming, coming up in um, the nation, I guess it's out today, uh, is my ongoing debate with Ross Duthat, uh, the conservative, um, anti-choice columnist for the New York Times. Um, so I did a column where I asked these open-ended questions to uh, pro-lifers, um, where I tried so, I, I, I actually worked really hard not to be snarky, not to be sarcastic and mean, and you know, all like that, just open-ended. I really want to know what you think. Um, so finally, he answers at tremendous length. Uh, which is really unfair because I don't have all the, you know, I don't have as much space as he does in his blog. Um, but anyway, uh, so he says, he says, you know, well, I think pro-choicers, in the section about poverty, um, he thinks um, pro-choicers don't give 
anti-abortion people enough credit for all the wonderful charity they do. And I, I said, well, you know, maybe so. But the fact is, poverty is all around us. <laughs> and women and children are suffering greatly. Pro charity cannot solve this problem. So his idea of how to solve the problem, and you know, here you realize that you're just, it's like you're talking to someone who just doesn't know about life. His idea is, we need tax credits. We need child tax credits or an inc bigger earned income tax credit. Now, the earned income tax credit is a great thing. It was it lifted a lot of people out of poverty. But in order to get a tax credit, you have to have a job. Um, and people who are working, who are, you know, these uh, mothers overburdened with children are not in a good position to work enough so that these tax credits would mean anything to them. Um, so. But anything else, and here I'm kind of agreeing with you a little bit, I, I just don't want to think of its cruelty. I think it's just some kind of, we don't really want more poor people. I think that's sort of it. That's what LePage, maybe when he, what he's saying, is if, you're really, if you have this amount of money, which is really nothing, then you shouldn't be having children. Um, and I just think that's the wrong way to go. It's not in the spirit of letting people flourish. We should let everybody flourish. If somebody wants to have a baby, they should be able to have a baby, and we should take care of them and take care of the baby, and maybe that baby will grow up and be a wonderful you know, contribution to society, um, and it'll all be great. They're just interested in forcing you to have a baby. Uh, that's the problem. Um, like when they talk about, um, OK, here's a thing that is often said is like, oh, what if a woman had an abortion and she'd had five children already and uh, her husband, you know, she was mentally ill and her husband was a big drunkard and they had no money and she had an abortion. Oh, you just aborted Beethoven. <laughs> and, well, okay, but maybe Hitler, you know? I mean, you never know. You never know how they're going to turn out. And so I wrote about this in the book and I said, yeah, but okay, so it might have been, Beethoven's life was actually not like, uh, his family was not like that at all. Um, but uh, I said, well, what if, it was, what if you, she'd kept Beethoven, but she got rid of some of his brothers who were really a, a big trial to him in his life. They were really worthless. Uh, and so the point is that there, the, there's an interest in forcing people to have children, but there isn't an interest in helping children, helping mothers and children, so that when these kids are here, they, they get to develop and into, uh, you know, full contributing members of society. Um, I, I don't know why this is so complicated. Other countries have income transfer programs that really affect the levels of poverty, especially child poverty, um, where if you didn't have those programs, you'd have a lot of poverty. And once you have them, there's very little poverty among children. But the United States has, I think, the highest rate of child poverty in the industrialized West. It's really a scandal. And I would love it if anti-choice people, this is something I think we probably could all work together on. I would love it if anti-choice people said, you know, that's really a problem and it would help, not just help the kids that everybody wants to be born, that mother wants to have, father wants to have, but the ones that we intend to force into being. Um, so let's work on child poverty. That would be really great. But I don't see very much of that happening. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how we say, well, nobody's pro abortion, we're pro choice. Well, sometimes you're pro abortion if that's what a woman wants. I agree with you. And how do we get around that and start really not falling into their traps around messaging? I think that we have to start from a different place. I think your, your examples are very good. Um, uh, we have to start from a different place. And the place is saying, look, abortion is part of our society. Sometimes it is, well, I would say it is always the right solution if a woman doesn't want to have a baby. Um, the important thing is that the people who are here are wanted and well cared for. And that is not consistent with forcing women to have children. Um, I felt bad when it, in that Komen, that whole, remember that whole thing with the Susan Komen Foundation. Uh, when they were trying to take those grants away from Planned Parenthood, that the, the Planned Parenthood, their big 
thing was, oh, but you know, only 3% of what we do is abortion. And I think you know, it's great to remind the world, it's very important now, especially to remind the world that Planned Parenthood also provides uh, you know, basic health care and birth control and STD um, uh, cures, med medication for uh, one in five women in America who has visited a clinic. That's kind of amazing. Um, but uh, it's, why couldn't they just say, you know, we do all this great stuff that you're forgetting. And you know, we also provide abortions and we're proud to offer that service to American women. I think they could have said that. Um, and although some people say, hey, Katha, you know, it kind of worked what they did. <laughs> so they did get the grants back and, you know, all those anti-choice people had to leave the Komen Foundation because they were so exposed. Um, but I think in general we have to stop the reactive messaging. And the reactive messaging is partly a response to the fact, the unfortunate fact, that the, uh, that the other side is so energetic, they're so clever, they're always doing, you know, they're coming at you from, every, from all different directions in every state. Um, and whereas, you know, Planned Parenthood is basically a healthcare organization. They are not primarily, um, you know, a, um, a political organization. They're there to provide medical care for people. And this has been a big learning curve for them. I mean, there was, they had a big discussion, I learned, about whether they should even have a, a PAC to raise money for candidates. And that some people felt that was really contrary to the spirit of what, of what Planned Parenthood does. And eventually they, those people, um, lost, the, you know, were persuaded. Um, but uh, I think that um, the other side is um, very energetic, clever, successful. Um, they're very well funded, and they have lots of ground troops, lots of people who agree with them, um, or agree with them enough. See, that's the thing, getting back to the muddled middle, just to say one more thing about them. Even though there are very few people that actually sign on to the whole anti-abortion um, you know, list, uh, the, full, the full Monty of, you know, let's make it a crime, let's put doctors in prison. Um, there are a lot of people who can be persuaded by, by a piece of it. For example, um, the 20-week abortion ban. Well, really, uh, I have a friend who said this, although now she denies ever having said it, but she said, Katha, um, five weeks is plenty, five months is plenty of time to get an abortion. Um, I, I really just think this is horrible. And her picture was, you know, the woman is just not paying attention, and then, oh my goodness, it's 21 weeks. Um, and I'm thinking, well, let's say there is a woman like that. <laughs> should we force her to have a child? Um, maybe she's the one who most should have the abortion that she wants. Uh, <laughs> but uh, um, there is, uh, there are enough people that, you know, they don't like to think of, that's really pregnant. I remember what it was like to be five months pregnant. That is very pregnant. Um, and I'm always surprised that, you know, uh, one reason women have these late abortions, it's kind of interesting, is they don't realize they were pregnant before. And I must say, although I have been told this and I've read about it and doctors have said yes, I don't get it. I really don't. Um, even though the mother of a friend of mine worked for Planned Parenthood, had had two children, and didn't realize she was pregnant until you know she was like 23 weeks pregnant. Um, I don't get that, but I have to just say, okay, but that's my body is not like that. I'm, and someone else's body is like that. Um, so I think that people are easily uh, persuaded to go for the half measure, like, uh, well, shouldn't they think about it a little more? Let's have a, let's have a longer waiting period. In Missouri now and North Dakota, it's 72, 72 hours. And you might think, that's three days, that's not a big deal, but yeah, but there's only one clinic. <laughs> and you have to drive there, and then you have to stay there for three days, and you don't have, I mean, it raises the cost of an abortion from like, a first trimester abortion from like, you know, $500 to like $1,500. Um, and that places it out of reach of many, many people. And that's the point. That's the thing. Um, there is nothing right now that prevents women from thinking, mm, 
I think I'd like to have an abortion, but I think I'll take a little more time to think about it. There are plenty of women who make an appointment at a clinic and then they say, you know, I'm, I'm really not ready. Okay, fine, take the, the you know, the, it's not like the clinic is going to say, I'm sorry, you promised, we're having the abortion now. <laughs> they'll, they'll say, I want you to go home and think about it some more. Um, a, an abortion clinic should not be performing abortions on people that don't really, you know, aren't really certain of what they want to do, and a good place will not do that. Um, so, but it's easy to persuade people that these restrictions are not important. It's like the trap laws, you know, that have closed so many clinics in Texas under protect women's health. Well, and, and people don't know anything about medical stuff, so they think, oh yeah, well, shouldn't the doctor have admitting privileges at a hospital nearby? Why? The fact is, it's completely unnecessary. The, if, if some terrible medical thing happens, which is very rare, the ambulance will take the woman to the hospital and she will be taken care of there in the emergency room as she would be for any other uh, terrible accident or thing like that. If she has to show up later because um, she's not feeling well, um, I mean, if it's a sort of less grave thing, the same thing. The emergency room is the place for all those things. And this, these rules are only for, adopt, for abortion doctors. Um, so, but to people that don't really think it through, it sounds right. It sounds like, oh yeah, the abortion clinic, that's probably a really terrible place. That doctor should really be looked over by the hospital. We want to make sure. Uh, but then he can't get the admitting privileges because the hospital won't doesn't want anything to do with abortions. I mean, it might be a Catholic hospital, but it might be a regular hospital that just thinks, oh my God, we don't need this. Um, and so it's the same thing with, uh, you know, making, the, it has to be a surg surgical center uh, for this very simple procedure that isn't even really surgical. I mean, if you get an abortion pill, you should not have to, you know, have this enormous million dollar clinic for something that could happen in a doctor's office just as easily. But people think, oh yeah, we want it to be safe. This is, this is going to protect women. And they don't look deeper than that. Um, so this has all been very successful. The trap laws are brilliant. Um, and uh, I hope it's turning around because in, I mean, in Virginia, they just sort of said, no, no, you can't have that, after they threw out the Republican anti-choicers and brought in a pro, uh, Democrats. Um, but these are very successful ways of um, getting the muddled middle to go along. And then by the time they realize that they've been played, it's too late. So anyway, um, maybe that's enough of, of me. And I, I invite you all to come back and um, back there, buy a book, I'll sign it. Um, we can talk some more. Thank you so much.